Are you ready to do some pod crashing? Episode number 187 is with Kareen from Paradise Lost, Crime in Miami. In a really bizarre way, do you feel like that you're taking away the mystique of, of Miami? Because it's, it's like, wow, Miami, they got the drugs, they got the crime, that's really cool. And you guys take us into an area, it's like, hey, but you don't know the real story. And I love that about what you guys are doing on this podcast. I appreciate that. You know, I don't think you can take away the mystique from Miami or, or frankly, from any place, uh, because, um, you know, cities and certainly Miami are more complicated than uh, that we could capture in just one podcast episode or that anyone could capture in a book or um, a TV show or a movie. But what we're trying to do through Paradise Lost Crime in Miami is examine Miami through the lens of the true crime that's been committed here. What does it say about our culture? What does it say about our people? What does it say about this place that some of the most heinous crimes committed in, in history uh, of the United States have happened right here in sunny South Florida? Um, and, you know, we look at it through a prism of like, uh, you know, how, how did this happen? How could it happen? Why did it happen? Um, and I like to say we don't we don't revel in the in 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 the violence. We certainly cover it and and, and tackle it head on. Um, and I think in many ways, uh, instead of you know taking the mystique away, I think maybe it makes it a little bit even more interesting. Because after you listen to all of these episodes with crimes that you know vary from from murders and the drug trade to you know love triangles uh i think in some ways people might be like hell i might want to go visit south florida <laughs> and uh and so i i guess this is my long way of saying that the tourism board owes me a check <laughs> it, it, it's so true because i mean i've been to south beach i fell in love with south beach i i wanted to get deeper into south beach and it's it's, it's just there because there's something there yeah you know I, I, I've often been thought about uh, well, what is it about this place? I think that there's certainly, first of all, it's just so naturally beautiful. Mm -hmm. I mean, the skies here are stunning. The, it's such a green city. There's wonderful architecture. Culturally, it's so rich. Uh, thanks to the amazing immigrant experience that we have here, folks coming from all over the world have contributed sounds and foods and languages. Um, it, it, it is kind of a, a very alluring place and it's a place that people kind of keep drawn to. So there's beautiful people and fascinating people kind of everywhere you go. Um, but among all of that, there's also kind of this crazy folks. And yeah. it turns out that, you know, sometimes there is a, sometimes among the best of the best, uh, it, it also exists the worst of the worst. And Miami's no different in that sense. Um, but it, you know, it's certainly an appealing place. As a, as a, as a person who's born and raised here, I always say my favorite time is when I leave Miami. Yeah. And then my second favorite time is when I come back to it because there's something that keeps drawing you back and back. Yeah. I, I be, Before I jumped into the podcast and really got into each one of the episodes, I was hoping that you would cover the Versace area. And and the reason why is because I, I've been to that mansion and, and it's like, it, it's such a place and, and you, you felt something when you were there. When you jumped into this story about Versace, because it, to me it's still a crime that a lot of people don't understand. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so that's a crime that I I remember all too vividly. Mm -hmm. um, it happened in 1997. Um, I was, and, and I talk about this in the episode. You know, I was uh, w when it happened. Part of you know we heard was that there's this uh, a gay serial killer, right? And I was uh, 17 or 18 when this happened. Uh, you know, just kind of mostly just kind of coming out and. Uh, and it was a fearful time. And then all of a sudden, on top of that, and kind of right in your own backyard, you had like a murderer loose. Uh, and this world famous person who was, uh, uh, who was murdered. And there was a heightened sense, for me, it was very personal because there was a heightened sense of, um, of fear associated with it. We didn't know what, what could happen and, and who could be next. Um, but it, it was such a complicated uh, story because Versace contributed so much to what the modern image of Miami was. I mean, in, in many ways, he really kind of uh, spearheaded that reinvention of Miami in the 90s, right? We had just come out of the 80s cocaine wars when yep. South Florida, when Miami was the murder capital of the world. Um, and it had just kind of come through with that and been reinvented itself. And now the 90s came, you had folks like Gianni Versace who helped to reinvent the image of the city as a place where celebrities came to play, where there was a constant party, where it was sexy and fun, but laid back and chill. 
And in a way, the murder of Gianni Versace in 1997 really kind of shifted the trajectory of the city in a really, really dramatic way. Um, and it impacted so many different communities, you know, in, including my own. Um, uh, it, it was a fascinating story and what a privilege for us to be able to talk to somebody who was really at the epicenter yeah. of it all. Uh, uh, police chief of uh, Miami Beach, Richard Barreto, uh, who was on the ground uh, and whose, uh, whose law enforcement agency did such an amazing job. Um, as he points out in that, in that episode, a, a particular part of pride for him was, um, you know, uh, Andrew Cunanan committed a crime in Miami Beach and never left Miami Beach after that. And uh, so there's something to be said about about the amazing work of the Miami Beach Police Department. Mentally, how did you how, how do you keep so strong? Because it, you're you're jumping into stories that are so dark. And the way that you're sharing the story is that you're, you're getting our emotions involved in this as well. I mean, look at the story with with Linda Cooney, with with the men in her life. Something kept going wrong here. Yeah, I mean, you know, <sighs> There, you do sometimes you do have to kind of compartmentalize uh, some of these cases uh, because the details are so harrowing when you take a step back. But I think that our approach, my co-host, uh, co-producer Joy Dowd and I, our approach has been to look at these stories as as a way of saying, what does this say about our society, about our community, right? Let's we, we you know what does it say about who we are, and so you know it, it's it's the stories are certainly larger than life and crazy and we don't shy away from any of the gory details but i think that moreover we kind of look at it with kind of the curiosity of like what how could this have happened why could this have happened <laughs> and and i think that the why is really kind of what uh, what keeps us from from ourselves from going a little ber- berserk with uh with all the crazy details that we learn uh linda cooney is a perfect example here's a woman who had come from another part of the country to s- establish a life for herself in palm beach you know a very wealthy community uh, lands a, a wealthy husband, has kids, uh, and uh, gets, goes through a, a acrimonious divorce where she kills her husband in point, point blank in front of one of her young child. Um, and then only a few decades later is accused of, uh, it's not accused, only a few decades later actually shoots the same <laughs> son who witnessed her, uh, her husband's death. Um, and there's so many questions around that. I mean, it's, it's a, it's, it's almost some of these cases almost are so, uh, so larger than life that they're too crazy to be true. But indeed, they all are. When when you build up these stories, I mean, because I mean, you're getting the sound, you know exactly how you're going to place the sound in it. Because when when you podcast like this, it's not like doing the five o'clock news or anything like that. I mean, you've got to have our attention, keep our attention, deliver it, and then and then get us back. So so how are you building your podcast to make sure that we keep coming back to every single episode? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, the, the, pull, I love to pull back the uh, the curtain a little bit. Well, I would first say that you know we don't actually approach it with a formula in mind. We okay. actually let the interview and the research uh, really kind of drive our storytelling. So, the 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 way that the, the ultimate podcast structure is, it's Joey and I narrating the crime for our listeners, and then we invite a special guest associated with it, and this can be a victim of the crime, a perpetrator, uh, law enforcement, a journalist, a filmmaker, somebody who's really well steeped in what's going on. And uh, through their interviews, they add a little bit more color and detail into what occurred. But we always start with kind of interviewing our key source. We do extensive research, read everything that's ever been written on the subject uh, to get all of our background. And then we find somebody who can speak to it uniquely um, and they help tell us the story. So. Be, because it's coming kind of from that really authentic place and, um, you know, fact checked across multiple sources and we hear, you know, kind of somebody directly connected to the story, it ensures that there's a, there's authenticity in it. Um, so that when we sit after we've done that, we sit down to script it and put it together. Um, <clears throat> we're able to just, you know, hone in on, on the all the minute details that you might miss but that make a great deal of importance in the story as well as kind of the details that everybody read in the headlines um and uh, and then we work with a great team at at our partners at sonoro to to layer in music and sound design to really kind of make it an atmospheric listen uh that we hope is is gripping as gripping as the crimes uh themselves so miss blanco the godmother of miami oh my god i had no clue that this was even taking place 
I yeah, right under our very noses, right? Uh, <laughs> Griselda Blanco, uh, you know, was known as La Madrina, which is the uh, the godmother, and, and that episode's called the Cocaine Godmother. Um, and her story is a fascinating one because she was one of the few women running a huge drug operation. Um, and really, she was, you know, a drug. We say drug kingpin. She's a drug queenpin, <laughs> in 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 a in a field that was dominated by men. And and it, she wasn't just a success. She was really right at the top, you know. And many many uh, sources indicate that she helped Pablo Escobar get his start, even though they would later become huge um, huge enemies. Oh wow. Um, her her story is is kind of fascinating on a couple of uh, on a couple of fronts. One is you know obviously you, we acknowledge that what she was doing was highly illegal and highly um illicit but besides the fact that it was highly illegal and illicit she ran an impressive organization that was bringing in billions and billions of dollars annually and she did all of this while being a fugitive from the law mm-hmm. and while being uh in a business that was completely illegal every aspect of it was illegal from the selling to the importation to the consumption, to the money, uh, and she and she managed to build a ginormous network, you know, with more than six or seven hundred people working under her. Um, of course, the other part of her story that is uh, that can't be uh, looked over is that part of the way that she did this is by ruling ruthlessly. Um, with a penchant for for vicious and gruesome brutality, and you know, there's more than over 200 murders that are accredited to her that she either uh, ordered uh, or orchestrated, and in some cases committed. Um, but it's one of those stories that you know, you, you when you hear it and you hear about it the first time, you just kind of shake your head and say, "Oh my <laughs> God!" Um, and it's, but you know, the funny thing is that she's one of those folks. She's one of those. Uh, criminals that have kind of inspired uh, the pop cultural zeitgeist. Uh, uh, you know, there's a uh, there's a Lifetime movie with Catherine Zeta Jones from a few years ago, and right now Netflix, uh, in a, I think later this year, Netflix is premiering a new series starring Sofia Vergara as Griselda Blanco. So she she's she went back from being you know famous and infamous she's now been notorious and so it was a great episode for us to kind of kick our show off and we had the wonderful documentary filmmaker and my dear friend billy corbin yeah. who made a fantastic doc uh cocaine cowboys uh he kind of helped talk us through her her trajectory um which is uh, astounding. Is there a side of your cre- creative imagination that would like to put yourself, take all of your knowledge and then put yourself on the court case as an expert witness? Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> you know, I, I listen, I, I would say it's hard enough to be able to speak without dropping uh, words. I can't say on radio. I couldn't <laughs> imagine being able to do it in a court of law. Uh, <laughs> I am I am much more fascinated by uh, by really examining what what do these things say about who we are yeah. um, and about our society, right? Like, what what do the true crimes kind of uh, what do they mean about who we are as a folks, and what does our fascination with them say about who we are? So. Um, you know, I don't know if I, I, I don't know if I could be held in the court of law, but the great thing about that is I can do it in a podcast <laughs> and I can do it so that, um, you know, with my dear friend, Joey Dowd, and we could talk about what this means uh, as folks who come from these places, right? Who in many places, in many cases, grew up streets away from where some of these things oh happen. And, um, and what does, you know, how does that affect who you are and how you become and, and your sensitivity to things? And, you know, I will say that while I never um, I, I'm never uh, uh, not flabbergasted by the brutality of some of these things, when I when I do hear about a crazy crime happening everywhere, I think that my reaction is probably a little more watered down than most because I grew up in South Florida where these crazy crimes seem to be the norm, not the exception. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I think I, I think that's my very long way of saying that there's very little that shocks me these days. Now, uh, so I might not I might not be great in a court. So, how did the Miami Zombie get the, get the name? Well, the case of Rudy Eugene is. Um, is one uh, that's really kind of fascinating. It happened a decade ago, uh, actually ten years ago last week. Wow! And um, and uh, what made it stand out in the name of the, uh, with with the kind of headline of the Miami Zombie or the Causeway Cannibal is that 
Rudy Eugene attacked uh, a homeless man named Ronald Popo, and and the attack was quite vicious in that he literally chewed off shooed off a large part of his face. Goodness. Um, and, and, and so much so that, that Mr. Popo lost uh, both of his eyes and something like 75% of his face. Um, and that's the kind of thing that you really only hear in horror movies, right? Or in um, in, 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 in gory uh, stories that are made up. And here's something that, you know, happened in actuality. Um, and, you know, as often is the case, folks in, in looking for an answer drew a number of conclusions. I remember um, voodoo came up because Mr. Eugene was, uh, was a Haitian immigrant or the child of Haitian immigrants. Voodoo was one of the first things. And then we, the, the term bath salts, the street drug known as bath salts or flaca, mm-hmm. those kind of came up. And, and you know, oftentimes uh, what we see with some of these stories is that we just get the headlines, right? We just get what's on the five o'clock news or what makes the front page of the newspaper the next day, and that's all you ever learn. So for this one, we really wanted to dig more because um, that's, you know, that's not normal. You don't hear a ton about people just on drugs who go and attack (laughs) someone, right? And so this episode is really interesting to us, for one, because um, we had the privilege of speaking with Markinson, Mr. Eugene's brother, um, who uh, the family uh, the family had very rare has very very rarely spoken uh, to the media and and we had the privilege of speaking to him you know what do the effects of the crimes his brother committed uh, have on the family and on the community but also get to the the, the, the kind of more uh, serious questions like what could have caused this and in, in essence this is a this episode is ultimately uh, it's about this horrific crime and all that happened to it but it's also a a question about mental health Mm -hmm. and about you know justice that isn't always colorblind um so uh, that's you know it's actually one that i'm really really proud of because i think that it's uh it's helping us really kind of get it behind the headlines into the heart of of what is a very complicated thing because i think in most of the crime cases we hear about they all tend to be a little bit more complicated <laughs> than just what uh what we see uh on the 11 o'clock news yep you got to come back to this show anytime in the future the door is always always going to be open for you Oh, thank you so much. That's such a kind thing to say. And thank you all so much for listening. Uh, check out Paradise Lost, Crime in Miami. Absolutely. You'd be brilliant today, okay? Thank you so much. You too, Arrow.